Chapter 1. Transformation A Bag of Stones Long ago, before the coming of horses, the people were strong and prosperous. Their villages were many across the wide prairie lands west of the Muddy River. Their strength came from a well-ordered society with rules of conduct for both men and women. Men were the hunters and warriors, the providers and protectors. Women were the center of the family, the first teachers of the children. Children were taught early that everything and everyone had a place and a purpose. Elders were revered as the source of knowledge and wisdom. Everyone treated elders with courtesy and respect. However, in one village which pitched its lodges along the Bad River, there was one boy who did not heed all the lessons he had learned. His name was White Wing. He was a tall, good-looking boy on the verge of young manhood, the only child of bare eyes and walks far woman. Like all Lakota parents, they had doted on the boy, teaching him to be a good and compassionate person. But perhaps because he was taller and stronger than other boys his age, he was somewhat vain. Things that other boys struggled to learn and master had come easily to White Wing. More and more, he would walk through the village, his head held high, knowing that he was the center of attention. White Wing's growing arrogance was cause for concern because his father was the leader of warriors and head of the Red Hand Warrior Society of men who had been wounded in battle. Bear Eyes was a fair and humble man, and most people were puzzled that any son of his could tend toward vanity and arrogance. People talked about white wing and whispers behind their hands, wondering what Bear Eyes would do about his son. Bear Eyes and Walk's far woman had already decided what to do about their son. One fine morning, the leader of warriors paid a visit to an old man, a widower, and the village's only medicine man, Grasshopper, was the old man's name. Stories circulated in many villages about the mysterious, mostly blind medicine man. Much of it was gossip, but everyone knew that no one was wiser, shrewder, or trickier than old Grasshopper. A few days after the leader's visit, Bear Eyes took his son to the lodge of the old medicine man. He told White Wing that Grasshopper had need of his help. Near a shallow chalky stream to the south were special river stones that the old medicine man wanted to gather so that he could use them in a sweat lodge ceremony. As everyone knew, stones were heated in a large fire pit and placed into the center pit of the half dome sweat lodge. Then a medicine man poured water to create steam for purification for the participants. White Wing had taken part in many sweats. White Wing knew that Grasshopper's request was the same as being told what to do. He did not want to anger his father by refusing, so he agreed to help the old man gather the stones and bring them back to the village. As the following dawn broke over the eastern horizon, Grasshopper and White Wing were on their way. Grasshopper had no weapons. He used only a walking stick and carried an elk hide, a water flask, a bag full of things the boy could not see, and a rolled up bag made of tanned elk skin for carrying the stones. White Wing had his own water flask, a food bag, a bow, and a quiver of arrows a lance, and a deer hide blanket. They traveled slowly, owing to the old man's age and bad eyesight. The boy stifled his impatience. 
The first evening, he gathered wood, built a fire, and shared his wasna, a mixture of dried bison meat and pounded choke cherries mixed with tallow and oil rendered from fat with his companion. It would be good to have fresh meat, the old man said as the sun was going down and the fire dying out. Perhaps my grandson can shoot a fat grouse or two for us tomorrow. Just before sunrise is the best time to hunt for them. Dutifully, though somewhat irritated, White Wing arose before dawn and went to a nearby plateau. There he waited until the male prairie grouse began dancing, stomping the ground and drumming their wings. The boy crawled through the grass until he was close enough for a shot, and he successfully took two birds. Grasshopper noisily enjoyed the meal of roast grouse, abruptly gathered his things, and struck out on the trail. For a mostly blind old man, he seemed to know where he was going. White Wing hurriedly put out the fire, gathered his own things, and followed the old man. After three more days of walking, they descended into a broad valley and made a camp near the confluence of two rivers. One river was the shallow chalky stream. Grasshopper indicated that the stones he needed could be found upriver, west of where the rivers met. I will wait here, he told the boy. Tomorrow you will gather the stones. I need four round like the moon, and each must be bigger than the one before it. Put them in this. He tossed the elk hide bag to White Wing. There is still daylight, the boy protested. I will go and get those stones now. No, the old man replied. I am hungry for fish. There are large black fish with the long whiskers in that river. Spear a big one for us. Not bothering to hide his irritation with the old man, the boy stomped away with his lance. Just before sundown, he returned with a large whiskered blackfish, catfish. With grumbles of protest, he butchered the fish, skewed it on green stalks, and hung it over the fire. The old man seemed not to pay any attention to the boy's discomfort. Instead, he sat with his eyes closed, singing a song to the spirits. As a matter of fact, the old man did not speak to the boy for the entire evening, except to thank him for sparing the fish and cooking it. As darkness fell, he cleared a place to sleep and curled up under his elk hide. White Wing sat alone, watching the stars come out and listening to owls barking coyotes, the occasional bellow of a bison bull, and the melodious song of wolves. He had never been far from home alone. He pulled his weapons close. His father had mentioned that this area was known for bears. The large humped bears that were much bigger than a grown man. He might as well be alone, he thought. The old man would be no help if a bear appeared. The boy hurriedly gathered more firewood, deciding to keep the fire burning through the night. The next morning, he awoke to hear the medicine man singing a sunrise song. Later, they finished what was left of the fish. I will wait here while you gather the stones. When you return with them, we will start for home, Grasshopper told the boy. Mumbling under his breath, the boy snatched up the elk hide bag and headed for the Chalky River. Before long, he found the bend in the river the old medicine man described, and on the old part of the riverbed were countless stones. Grasshopper's descriptions of the stones he wanted were puzzling, but finding that kind of stones was not hard. Soon the boy had picked out the four stones and headed back for camp. Grasshopper opened the bag and looked briefly at the stones. Good, he said. Now we go home. But we will go west. There is a narrow valley with a creek. And the bottomland is thick with sweet grass. 
I want to gather as much as we can carry. White Wing sighed. He was anxious to go home, but not the long way. As they gathered their things and prepared to break camp, he considered taking a more direct route back to their village. But he knew his father would be angry if he arrived home without the old man. So the tall, handsome boy on the verge of manhood trudged along, pouting silently and wondering what old people were good for. On the second day, the old man once again spoke his yearning for fresh meat, this time deer. Half-heartedly, White Wing probed a long, narrow gully for almost half a day. He managed to frighten a deer from its bed, but it bounded away and was quickly out of bow range. At least he had tried, he told himself. When he returned to camp, he found the old man roasting two rabbits over the fire. They must be blind like me, the old man joked. They got caught in some snares I set by that creek. He said nothing about the fact that the boy had returned empty-handed. The boy ate sullenly, hoping that the next two or three days would pass quickly. By the afternoon of the next day, he could contain his frustration and impatience no longer. In spite of the weight of the bag of stones, he walked faster and faster, knowing the old man could not keep up. Nothing wrong with the little fun, he thought, wondering what the medicine man would do when he suddenly realized he was alone. From the top of a low hill, White Wing stopped and looked back. The old man was plodding along, picking his way with his walking stick. The boy decided to run to the next hill. Enjoying his new game of teasing the old man, he reached the hill and began to trot down the slope, intending to have a drink from the creek. He did not see the bear until he nearly ran into it. The animal was already standing on its back legs. It was a deep brown in color and looked to be twice as tall as a grown man. White Wing heard a soft, inquisitive woof, dropped the bag of stones, and stood rooted to the ground for a few heavy heartbeats. White Wing's bow was in its case, unstrung, the lance all but forgotten. Never in his young life had he known such a moment. The boy and the bear stared at one another. In the next heartbeat, White Wing was sprinting as fast as he could toward a tall cottonwood tree. Behind him, he heard the bear's grunts and knew that it was gaining on him with every step. How the boy made it to the first low branch would always be a mystery to him. A swipe from the bear's enormous front paw sliced into the back of his leg and tore off his moccasin. Then he heard the animal's claws scratching at the bark of the tree. Out of its cavernous chest came a bellowing roar. Driven by a fear he had never known, White Wing grabbed for the higher branches, pulling himself up as fast as he could. From below he heard the bear grunting with its efforts to climb. The boy did not notice that the bow and quiver of arrows had slipped off his shoulder. Panting heavily, he kept climbing until he could go no higher. On the ground, the bear was now circling the tree. White Wing, weak with relief and shaking, watched the bear. He was prepared to spend the day in the tree, but then he thought of the old man, probably still walking toward the creek, unaware of the angry bear. Even if he was aware, he could not see beyond the length of his arm, nor could he hope to outrun the bear. To White Wing's dismay, the bear suddenly turned its attention away from the tree. Looking down the narrow little valley, the boy saw Grasshopper feeling his way along with his walking stick. At the base of the tree, the bear rose up on its back legs, dropped down, and trotted toward the old man. The boy put his head down. He could not watch. 
it was not difficult to imagine what would happen when the huge bear got hold of the defenseless old man. White Wing sat in the tree, waiting to hear the bear tear the medicine man apart. He had never seen a bear attack anything, animal or man, but he had heard stories from hunters. One had seen a bear chase and catch a young elk cow. Suddenly, he realized that everything was silent. No birds were calling. Even the breeze had stopped. Through the branches of the trees, he could see the bear and the old medicine man facing each other. Grasshopper reached into his bag, took something out, and waved it at the bear. The bear reacted strangely. After a moment, it backed away. After several more moments, it retreated, crossed the creek, and looped across a clearing into a grove of trees. From his vantage point in the top of the cottonwood tree, White Wing saw the bear trot over a hill and disappear. White Wing scrambled down from the tree, more than a little ashamed of himself for not being able to do anything to help the old man. Grandfather, he called out, after reaching the old man, you are not hurt. The bear did not attack you. The old man nodded and smiled. This is a good day, he said. What did you do? The boy wanted to know. I gave that bear something to think about, the old man replied. Do you have the bag of stones? No, grandfather, the boy admitted. I dropped them, and my bow and lance. Let us find your things and the stones. Then we can build a fire and have something to eat. But the bear, White Wing fretted, it might come back. No, the old man replied, smiling. I think he will stay away from us. As it turned out, they were not far from the little valley where the sweet grass grew. A breeze carried its sweet scent. Grasshopper insisted on eating, and soon there was a fire. White Wing gathered a large pile of firewood, not entirely convinced the bear would stay away, especially during the night. The old man made tea by heating a handful of small stones in the fire. He placed the hot stones into the water in his bison horn cup and added dried mint leaves. After they finished the last of their dried bison meat, Grasshopper was silent and seemed to be staring off to a place only he could see. White Wing waited, instinctively knowing that something was about to happen. He did not have to wait long. Show me the stones in your bag, the old man said. White Wing opened the bag and took out the stones. Put them in a straight line. Grasshopper instructed. First, the small one. Then the next biggest ones. The largest one should be last. Again, the boy did as he was instructed. Four stones sat in a straight line, smallest to largest. The old man cleared his throat. I am glad you picked nice round stones, he said, because life is like that. Life is a circle. Like all of these stones, look at the sun. It is round, a circle, and so is the moon. Drop a stone in a pond, and you see circles grow. The seasons go in a circle. Winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Over and over. When we pray, we start by facing west, where the great powers live. Then we turn north then east, then south. We show our respect to all our relatives by moving in a circle. The boy listened. He knew these things because all elders talked this way. Pick up the smallest stone, the old man said. White Wing did as he was asked. Even the life each of us lives is a circle, Grasshopper went on. First, we are like the stone in your hand, small, because as babies we know nothing and must depend on our family for everything. He pointed to the next stone, a little larger than the first. 
the boy picked it up and put down the other. In our childhood, the next stone, we learn the most because everything we learn is new to us. Our parents and grandparents and all the people in the village teach us how to behave, what our place is, how to do the things to make our lives comfortable and safe. This is where you are. He pointed to the next stone, again, slightly larger than the previous one. This is when we have grown up. Our bodies have reached the size we will be. As adults, we began to build knowledge, to take our place in the village, to do the kinds of things we need to for families. We raise our own families. We hunt and we fight when we need to. This is where your mother and father are. Now pick up the last stone. White Wing picked up the fourth stone. Pick up the first three with your other hand, the medicine man said. White Wing did as he was told. The fourth stone is heavier than the others together, Grasshopper asserted. The boy was astonished. It was so. The fourth stone is the final part of our lives, when we are preparing to finish the circle of our lives. Our bodies grow weaker, but we have done and learned much. Like that stone, we are heavy with knowledge, and we grow wise. This is where you are, grandfather, the boy said timidly. Yes, I am in the final part of my life. I cannot do the things I did as a younger man but I have learned things. Now it is my responsibility to give back the gift life has given me. What is that, grandfather? The boy wanted to know. Wisdom. It is why your mother and father talk to me about you. They want you to learn the right things so that you can be a good man. So in our little journey together, I have been watching and thinking I have decided what it is that you should learn. I am listening, Grandfather, White Wing whispered, afraid of what he was about to hear. Silence is difficult to ignore, the old man said. The boy nodded politely, though he was confused. He had no idea what it meant. Moments passed, and the old man spoke again. You are wondering why the bear did not attack me. Yes, grandfather, the boy admitted. The old man smiled and reached into his bag and pulled out a wooden vial. Pulling off the plug, he held the open vial out to the boy. Immediately, the sharp, pungent odor of skunk assaulted the boy's nose. He recoiled. Putting the vial away, the old man chuckled. I could not see that bear clearly, he said, but I think it was an older one, perhaps like me. A bear's nose can smell at great distances. It can smell things under rocks and even roots in the ground. A skunk's spray can be very painful to a bear's nose. And this one probably had a fight with a skunk at one time. He has never forgotten, which is fortunate for me. If it had been a young bear that knew nothing about skunks, the outcome would have been different. My grandfather taught me to carry a little vial of skunk oil just for bears. Days later, their journey was complete. The old medicine man and the boy arrived home with bundles of sweet grass and a bag of stones. Grasshopper told the boy to keep the stones as a reminder of their journey. Later that autumn, he taught the boy how to trap a skunk and extract the oil from the animal's scent glands so that he could carry his own vial of skunk oil. Now and then, White Wing pondered what the old man had said. Silence is difficult to ignore. He did notice that when the breeze stopped or a wind calmed, 
people had a tendency to look around at the landscape and into the sky. Sometimes, when White Wing found himself alone on a river bottom or out on the open prairie, there were moments when utter silence prevailed. No wind, no bird calls, no elk whistling, nothing. Only utter, profound silence. Such moments always made him pause. But it was not until the old medicine man died the following spring that he learned the meaning of the old man's words. People came from many villages for the old man's funeral. They feasted in his honor and talked of his life. An old, old man spoke the day the medicine man was laid to rest on his burial scaffold on a hillside. White Wing was surprised to learn that as a young man, Grasshopper had been known as, as High Whirlwind. In the prime of his life, he had been a stalwart warrior, one who had won many honors and the respect of everyone who knew him. It was a part of his life that the thin, nearly blind old man had never spoken of. Silence is difficult to ignore. White Wing understood what it meant. He visited the old man's burial scaffold as often as he could over the years. And over the years, he grew into the quiet, compassionate man his mother and father hoped he would.